Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you again, uh, and in particular, a really distinct pleasure to uh, host a discussion with two uh, anti-corruption crusaders who I consider to be close friends uh, and, and former colleagues in the fight against corruption. Uh, we have with us today uh, Maria Eugenia, uh, who was the vice president of the Financial Intelligence Unit of Argentina under the Macri uh, government. And uh, we have Mariano Federici with us, who was the president of the WEF, um, to discuss uh, really some pretty worrisome developments in their home nation of Argentina. Uh, I, I just noticed that uh, Argentina has you know, defaulted now twice on its sovereign debt. Uh, it has racked up a debt of $323 billion uh, that it owes, uh, and the economy is in severe, uh, in severe distress, contracting by almost 10% last year. Inflation's at 48%. Unemployment is above 10% now, uh, and so many people are, are living uh, below the poverty line um, in, in a nation where this simply should not be the case. Uh, at the same time, you have a vice president who is mired in corruption scandals, multiple corruption scandals, ranging from accusations of taking uh, bribes and kickbacks for public works, for oil permits, for casino licenses, um, all the way through uh, a scandal involving the EMEA bombing, uh, the Iranians, uh, and Hezbollah. Uh, and you have, at the same time, such significant growth in the organized crime families um, um, like the Casteros and Las Monas uh, uh, that engage in such a wide range of criminal activities. Uh, I will start with Maria Eugenia, uh, who is there living in Buenos Aires and uh, fighting the good fight uh, as, a, as, a, as a voice crying out in the wilderness. Uh, and then uh, Mariano, after her comments, I would invite you to, to offer your thoughts on the situation and then we'll move to questions and answers. Uh, I'm also very gratified to have with us today Nate Sibley, uh, who runs the Kleptocracy Initiative of the Hudson Institute, and uh, uh, which gives voice uh, to these, uh, these kleptocratic movements around the world that depend on people like you two uh, to combat, to fight, to call attention to, uh, and, and, to, and, to, and to really drive transparency uh, in the system. And so Nate will uh, also have a number of questions for you uh, as well as we proceed. Um, Maria Eugenia, uh, the floor is yours. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, Marshall. Nate, el, el interés del Instituto de Hudson para, para escuchar una voz desde la Argentina, tan lejos este, de Estados Unidos. Y, y bueno, y tan cerca hoy de, de los países de la región que, que sentimos que abandonan las luchas anticorrupción, antiterrorismo. Argentina, desde la vuelta de Cristina Fernández de Kirchner al poder, ha dado un giro nuevamente hacia los países de Venezuela, de Bolivia. Hemos dado refugio a Evo Morales este, antes de regresar nuevamente al poder en Bolivia. Eh, amigos, países... Argentina nuevamente amiga también de Cuba, de la dictadura del régimen cubano que ha dado refugio a la hija de Cristina Fernández de Kirchner cuando la justicia argentina avanzaba en los casos contra la familia de, de los Kirchner. Eh, estamos dando eh, muchos pasos para atrás en la lucha contra la integridad y con la corrupción, contra la corrupción. La vuelta de Cristina Fernández de Kirchner al poder tras un presidente muy debilitado que así que es Alberto Fernández y que es la figura que han elegido para que los argentinos sean engañados con su voto y permitir la vuelta del kirchnerismo al poder significa la vuelta de eh, sin duda gobiernos eh, como yo llamo castrochavistas a la región sur de América. Y estos gobiernos traen eh, claros planes de impunidad para los innumerables hechos de corrupción que obran desde el poder eh, y, y un plan también de persecución a quienes obviamente cuando pudieron avanzar los investigaron. La vuelta de Cristina Fernández de Kirchner al poder significa un plan de impunidad claro con un desmantelamiento institucional acelerado en tiempos de pandemia 
cuando los argentinos vieron su actividad económica absolutamente interrumpida por una cuarentena y un aislamiento social obligatorio que no nos permitía ni circular, ni reunirnos, ni trabajar, el Congreso trabajaba y avanzaba en leyes claras para desmantelar este, lugares estratégicos de la justicia y poder de esa manera obstruir que los innumerables casos de corrupción gravísimas que involucran a Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, a sus hijos y a muchos funcionarios que estaban en el gobierno entre el año 2003 y 2015, y han vuelto a cargos estratégicos en la Argentina, eh, puedan arribar con acciones hacia un plan de impunidad que hace que todos esos juicios se encuentren paralizados. Hemos tenido una buena noticia en estos tiempos con un juicio que ya estaba muy avanzado de corrupción, que es la ruta del dinero K, el tema BAES específicamente, pero son este, situaciones aisladas, porque la gran cruzada tiene que ver con casos de corrupción que involucran a Cristina Fernández de Kirchner de modo directo, así como a sus hijos, y que involucran a altos funcionarios como hoy es el Procurador General de la Nación, el Procurador del Tesoro de la Nación, que es el jefe de todos los abogados del Estado, eh, casos que involucraban al ex vicepresidente de la nación, este, Amado Vudú, eh, y otros asuntos muy, muy graves que lo que tienen que evitar es que lleguen a sentencia. Por eso persiguen a los jueces, están con un plan muy avanzado para atacar al Procurador General de la Nación, sacarlo, es la persona que dictamina ante la Corte Suprema de Justicia de la Nación y es quien puede evitar que si son condenados, este, la Corte confirme estas condenas, y también es el organismo que tiene a su cargo la acusación ante los, los juicios de corrupción, y si ese organismo es tomado tan, tal como está planificado por el quiterismo en el Congreso, los fiscales no van a tener la autonomía para acusarla, acusar a estos altos funcionarios en los juicios por corrupción. En la Argentina tomaron los organismos que actuaban como acusadores en estos casos de corrupción, la Oficina Anticorrupción, organismo emblemático este, que actuaba en estos juicios, ha desmantelado el área penal, por lo cual no hay organismos que acusen en esos, en esos juicios. La Unidad de Información Financiera que, que tuvimos el privilegio de conducir con Mariano era también creyente en estos asuntos y se ha retirado de todos los asuntos de corrupción y lavado de activos. Eh, entonces, sin estos organismos actuantes en los juicios, si toman a los fiscales que actúan en ellos, obviamente habrán logrado un gran avance en materia de impunidad, y esto está muy cerca de suceder en la Argentina. El ataque que desde las comisiones del Senado también está sufriendo el actual Procurador General de la Nación, es realmente un embate muy difícil de resistir, hasta diría de forma personal, no solo funcional, y por ahora obviamente eh, no están logrando los objetivos, pero van camino hacia eso. La deslegitimación de la Corte Suprema de Justicia de la Nación, queriendo crearle unos tribunales intermedios a partir de un consejo consultivo que el presidente ha creado, consejo consultivo que se encuentra conformado por los propios abogados que defienden a Cristina Fernández de Kirchner y a otros altos funcionarios del gobierno. Entonces realmente las acciones que se están llevando a cabo en la Argentina del desmantelamiento institucional para que todos estos casos gravísimos de corrupción yo he presentado un estudio ante los organismos internacionales de crédito y otros organismos internacionales que dan cuenta que los casos que allí se relatan, casos de corrupción que involucran nada más que a estos altos funcionarios, este, revelan a, a, aproximadamente, significan un 15% de la deuda que Argentina tiene actualmente con el eh, Fondo Monetario Internacional, nada más que con ese organismo de crédito. Entonces el impacto macroeconómico de los casos es realmente muy alto, que si junto a este plan de desmantelamiento institucional Argentina no juzga ni logra las sentencias condenatorias, realmente es nuevamente un retroceso en materia de confianza, de integridad y de, y de el, el, el Estado de Derecho en pie, porque realmente lo habrán destruido todo. Y aquí es un poco esta comparación con Venezuela, que por ahí este, quien, quien sigue un poco las, las, las cuestiones sobre las que yo me explayo tiene que ver con la toma 
del Poder Judicial y de los fiscales, no solo para lograr la impunidad en, en muchos casos de corrupción, eh, sino también para perseguir a quienes osan este, oponerse o revelar las cuestiones en las que se encuentran involucrados. Eh, y entonces eh, estamos muy, muy complicados hoy en la Argentina con este plan sistemático que vienen obviamente ideando desde que han asumido de nuevo, de nuevo el poder. No quiero entrar en el detalle de cada uno de los casos, pero creo que el emblemático es el caso de los cuadernos, los, los, el conocido internacionalmente, porque era eh, el chofer de uno de los ministros más importantes de la Argentina tomando notas sobre la cantidad de sobornos que se han pagado en la Argentina durante varios años, durante 12 años, este, recolectando bolsos este, donde los empresarios también formaron parte de un entramado de corrupción pública realmente muy significativo, donde muchísimos arrepentidos han dado cuenta de lo que nos estuvo sucediendo en la Argentina durante más de 12 años, y esto es la corrupción del gobierno kirchnerista que ha vuelto al poder, y, y lo que revelan los casos, en definitiva, no es que las políticas, es, es un entramado de corrupción en todas las políticas públicas del Estado Nacional, que los jueces han dicho que se organizaba desde las máximas autoridades del Estado. Esto es sin duda corrupción sistémica y estructural, lo han dicho los jueces en todos los asuntos elevados a juicios, desde las máximas autoridades del gobierno nacional se organizaban actos de corrupción que han saqueado las arcas de la Argentina durante 12 años con políticas de obra pública, de salud, de energía, hasta en el deporte, este, por, 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 más allá de las, los casos internacionales del FIFA Gate, en la Argentina también este, todas las políticas públicas se vieron permeadas y atravesadas por gravísimos casos de corrupción, que hoy se evita que lleguen a sentencia y que se reciban sus, sus condenas. Puedo seguir, pero si quieren le puedo dejar el espacio a Mariano eh, para, para poder ahí complementar y obviamente luego poder contestar preguntas. Muchas gracias. Please, Mariano. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marshall. Thank you, Nate. Thank you the Hudson Institute for this uh, invitation. It's really a pleasure for me to be uh, addressing you and your audience. Um, I think, you know, as, as Eugenia just um, put in context, Argentina is really undergoing what I believe to be one of the darkest moments in, in, in its history. I think the kleptocracy of the Kirchners is, is back in government, fighting for its impunity and pursuing a strategy aimed at uh, concentrating power with the goal of uh, remaining in it in, in perpetuity. And also I think consolidating the myth, you know, it was Perón and Evita who saved the country in the 20th century, so they say. Uh, why not Nestor and Cristina in the 21st century then? This is how they envision it. Uh, this is populism, Castro Chavism. The truth, however, uh, lies in the evidence that builds up the criminal files in the federal courts of Buenos Aires. Uh, the cases are solid. They reveal, I believe, beyond reasonable doubt that a true criminal organization led by the Kirchners, led by the highest officials in power, um, sacked the Argentine state between 2003 and 2015, and then proceeded to launder the proceeds of their corruption uh, in uh, not only in Argentina, but also in other countries affecting global financial integrity. This is the evidence that must be discussed in trials and should not be ignored as the Kirchner's uh, pretend. In effect, uh, I think, you know, since their return to power in 2019, what we have seen is that an impunity plan has been masterminded and is currently being implemented. The plan aims uh, concretely at evading justice from the serious accusations of corruption and money laundering for which they're duly being tried. And it also involves, uh, as Eugenia said, motorizing attacks uh, on those who, who I think have the courage uh, of reporting them, investigating them or judging them for the conducts of corruption and money laundering that they're certainly responsible for. Uh, the objective is not only to seek revenge uh, with those that brought them to the stand, uh, but also to spread fear 
deterring future reporting and investigations by judges, prosecutors, public officials, journalists, and, and ordinary citizens. The journalists uh, in particular, the free press, is under uh, direct threat by, by the Kirchners and particularly those that have the courage to investigate them. So it, in the absence of, of uh, strong arguments to counter the evidence that supports these accusations, they resort to the good old strategy of victimizing themselves uh, through the narrative of political persecution, which they now rebaptized uh, with the use of an English term they call lawfare. Um, so the, these, to, be, to be clear, uh, these false claims of lawfare uh, were also more recently uh, coupled by initiatives that amount to what uh, we have come to denominate what Eugenia has actually come to denominate the, uh, an institutional destruction uh, led by Christina Kirchner herself and her followers. Uh, as we speak right now, attacks continue to be orchestrated by, by uh, the government's uh, Ministry of Justice against the prosecutors and against the judges that are responsible for trying Christina and her family. Uh, legal strategies have been deployed to immobilize ongoing trials and prevent new ones from starting. Look, the two main trials against Cristina, uh, um, Otesur and Los Sauces, which has now been unified under one trial, they were elevated to trial more than two years ago, more than two years ago, and there's still no date set for the beginning of the trials. Of course, there is uh, incredible pressure being put on the courts for those trials not to start. Uh, judges that complied with their duties to apply the law were removed uh, and control agencies such as the anti-corruption agency uh, or the FIU that we had the honor to, to lead with Eugenia have been neutralized. Uh, in addition, there is an ongoing attempt to, as, as uh, Eugenia said, as you rightly stated, uh, Marshall as well, to remove the uh, acting attorney general in order to take control of the prosecutorial services. This is important as Argentina moves to an adversarial, to an accusatory system where prosecutors are going to have the lead in the investigations. Also, a judicial reform has been put forward in an attempt to create uh, more courts where new friendly judges could be appointed. Uh, this also includes a proposal to increase the number of justices of the Supreme Court of Argentina to ensure a favorable composition and, uh, and results in the court's final rulings taking into account that many of these cases are, are probably going to end up uh, at the Supreme Court. Does any of this sound familiar to anyone? Uh, yes, we've seen it before. And indeed, I think Argentina is heading directly towards Venezuela. Uh, but there is one big difference. Argentina owes the world more than $50 billion as a result of an IMF loan provided uh, to President Macri in 2018 the largest rescue package ever put forward for a country in the history of the, of the fund, which, where I also had the honor of, uh, to work. Uh, and the government now is renegotiating this package uh, to avoid having to make payments during their term. Uh, I therefore believe, we believe, uh, that uh, the international community has a, a chance to stop or at least to slow down the dismantling of Argentine institutions until, until the next elections by requesting conditions in the IMF program aimed at re, uh, reinstating the rule of law, protecting the independence of prosecutors and judges and strengthening the fight against corruption. This would be consistent with IMF policies, which over the past 10 years have uh, really emphasized the importance of integrity as a fundamental pillar to macroeconomic stability, growth and, and employment. I think, you know, the adverse macroeconomic impact that corruption itself generated in Argentina is now severely accentuated, to put it in some terms, by the current government's attempt to dismantle institutions in their search for impunity. So it's time to really put an end to this. And the IMF negotiations offer a unique opportunity to bring back some form of international check on the arbitrary abuse of power that is currently taking place. Finally, Marshall, uh, let me say that in my view, uh, the corruption that affected Argentina and the partnership between corrupt Argentine officials and Venezuelan officials is not only a threat to Argentina's financial integrity, but also to regional financial integrity 
including the integrity of the U.S. financial system, uh, as, as was the case with Chavez and the Maduro regime, uh, much of the money that Kirchner stole ended up being laundered in other parts of the world, including, I have to say, here in the United States. Uh, so this calls into serious question whether consideration should be given to the possibility of an OFAC designation uh, of the Kirchners, such as the one the Maduro regime has been subject to, uh, under global Magnitsky or other uh, uh, legal mechanisms. Uh, last week, uh, no, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Argentina took the, the decision to leave the Lima Group, as you um, probably read, and, and, uh, and then decided to drop the alerts that Eugenia and I, when we were running the FIU, had instituted warning the Argentine financial system about the threats of corruption connected with uh, OFAC designated Venezuelan officials, including Maduro himself and the need to uh, report suspicious transactions uh, presumably connected with them. The dismissal of these alerts implies an irresponsible disregard to the risks that Venezuelan corruption represents to the Argentine financial system. But apart from that, it implies uh, an explicit support to sanction Venezuelan officials, helping them evade US sanctions and therefore becoming a threat to the integrity of the US financial system and its national security uh, as well. So I'll leave it there and I'm open to uh, questions uh, answer them. Oh, thank you for that. I, I do find it, I think we all find it amazing that a country that owes three and a half billion in debt payments this year and a massive 18 billion owed next year and 19 billion the year after that uh, is throwing its lot in with the likes of Maduro and his cronies, the Cubans. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just astounding. Um, but I, I want to kind of pick up on where, where you left off with, in essence, the Kirchnerists signaling to the Maduro kleptocrats that, that uh, Argentina is open to Venezuelan business. Um, Maria Eugenia, you, you've been warning, repeatedly warning to anyone who will listen that um, Argentinians should not think that they're above all of this and somehow um, immune to what happened in Venezuela. Can you talk a little bit about, and Mariana as well, uh, this, this slide that we see uh, in the direction of Chavismo, uh, in the direction of, I mean, you, you talk about court packing, of course, some people are trying to pack the courts here in the United States as well, but uh, this is the path that kleptocratic autocrats take to cement power. It's what Chavez did uh, uh, in Venezuela by expanding the Supreme Court to put his loyalists on there. Uh, and now you have similar proposals in Argentina. Maria Ahenia, why don't you tell us your thoughts and the parallels and, 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 and then uh, Mariano, whatever else you'd, you'd add. I would love for you to articulate more specificity on what uh, the IMF could put as conditionality uh, in a future package uh, to try to stop this slide uh, into the abyss. Cómo no, Marshall. Eh, sí, lo que, di, lo que digo es que eh, eh, Venezuela tampoco pensó, los venezolanos tampoco pensaron eh, que iban a terminar como terminaron allá en 1999, este, cuando Chávez asume el poder, y que los argentinos no advertimos que la vuelta de Cristina Fernández de Kirchner viene con un plan muy claro de lo que no pudo hacer eh, cuando se terminó el gobierno en el 2015. Hoy vino por el eslabón de la corona, que es tomar al poder judicial la independencia de los jueces y de los fiscales para asegurarse impunidad, y es un manual que aplica el castrochavismo y todos los países este, de, la, de los socialistas del siglo XXI, como le dicen, de la región. Bolivia, Nicaragua, este, bueno, ahora está ahí viendo que esto sucede en Salvador, tomar, tomar la corte, tomar a los organismos que en definitiva tienen que reivindicar la vigencia de la ley es fundamental para estos regímenes y el kirchnerismo ha vuelto con estos planes, ninguna duda, a la Argentina y en las elecciones que vamos a tener este año 2021 la composición del Congreso es fundamental para los muy pocos votos que les faltan para poder empezar a sancionar las leyes este, que van a desarticular dentro de estas democracias los andamajes constitucionales de separación de poderes estrictamente. Ya no vamos a tener un poder judicial independiente, con lo cual 
este, la impunidad va a ser un hecho, la persecución de las personas que intenten oponerse, o esta sensación de que, que la Argentina no va a trabajar bajo estas reglas de juego, de, de corrupción, de falta de integridad, se va a ir de la Argentina, como sucede en estos regímenes, expulsan a las personas que quieren jugar con reglas de derecho de integridad, van a tomar, por supuesto, los medios de comunicación, este, intent, este intento en el anterior gobierno lo hicieron, cooptaron muchos medios, luego se acomodó un poquito los últimos cuatro años de otro gobierno, pero ahora van a volver por los medios de comunicación, están amedrentando a los periodistas que se animan a informar sobre hechos de corrupción, por lo cual la libertad de prensa también va a ser puesta en riesgo como parte de este manual, eh, y finalmente las cuestiones electorales, que son las, las patas que permiten este, la per perpetuarse en el poder, este, ya han tomado el juzgado federal, el juzgado electoral más importante de la provincia de Buenos Aires y también la Cámara Electoral, por lo cual no se les escapa la necesidad de para perpetuarse en el poder tomar las cuestiones electorales. Con un pueblo, con una Argentina que después de eh, medidas que se están tomando adrede, diría yo, con la excusa de la salud, han dejado en la pobreza a más del 45% de los argentinos con una necesidad muy grande de tener a estos estados que distribuyendo cajas ya sabemos lo que hacen, porque el régimen de cajas CLAP de Venezuela ha sido uno de los nichos de corrupción más grandes que tienen ese tipo de gobiernos, con una alianza con estos narcoestados que también ya permiten, teniendo cooptada la justicia y la corrupción metida en todos los estamentos, que un eh, cargamento de 23 toneladas de cocaína de Bolivia haya desembarcado del, pue del puerto de Argentina en Europa, con lo cual esto es lo que tenemos que empezar a ver. La evidencia es absolutamente empírica con el ataque a las instituciones, con lo que sucede con estos pueblos que dependen de, empiezan a depender del Estado con mucha resignación y con todos estos otros andamiajes que ellos saben usar muy bien con las alianzas con estos gobiernos de los que reciben ayuda. Entonces realmente creo que los argentinos no podemos dejar de reconocer muy claramente por la evidencia empírica de que nos estamos, estamos yendo camino a Venezuela con un plan muy bien pensado por parte del kirchnerismo y los apoyos regionales que tiene. Mariana. Um, fully endorse uh, uh, what Eugenia has said, and uh, I think you asked me about the uh, IMF, what the fund could do to uh, introduce conditionality into a, into a program. I think it would be really outrageous in my view if uh, such conditionality or uh, measures related with the uh, protection of the rule of law, uh, the independence of the judiciary, the independence of the prosecutorial uh, service uh, were not contemplated in the program in light of what we're all reading every day in, in the press and the facts that everyone uh, has, uh, uh, is, is aware uh, are, um, are, are occurring in Argentina. The fund has for many years uh, preached uh, the idea that um, you know, corruption, uh, money laundering are threats, direct threats to financial integrity and to the stability, uh, to the macroeconomic stability of, uh, of countries, and also to the stability and success of uh, fund supported programs. And this is a, a, a real case, a true opportunity Uh, to demonstrate uh, their commitment, the IMF's commitment to really uh, protect the yeah, financial integrity in, in Argentina and protect macroeconomic stability to the right type of, uh, of measures. Of course, the fund will not get into um, you know, the actual cases, uh, will not interfere with the uh, judiciary in Argentina. That should not be expected by it. But there are many uh, measures that can be placed in the program to strengthen, for instance, Uh, the autonomy of the anti-corruption uh, agency to strengthen uh, uh, the financial intelligence unit uh, uh, as well, uh, to protect the judiciary and its independence, to protect the prosecutorial service. There are attempts now that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that are aimed at weakening such independence. And I think, uh, you know, those are all um, measures that could definitely be appropriate uh, for inclusion In, in an IMF program. The objective of the program uh, 
should be also uh, related with reinstating and, and, and strengthening the rule of law uh, in Argentina, which is a, a fundamental condition to attract investment back into the country. Um, and I'm talking about uh, you know, medium-term investment, long-term investment, the, the kind of investment that Argentina needs to generate uh, employment, to generate uh, growth uh, and development going forward. Um, and, and that is now uh, lagging and, and, uh, and staying behind uh, in, in part and in great part because of these problems. I mean, who can trust at this moment uh, an investment, a long-term investment in Argentina with a scenario of, of, of a structural uh, corruption like the one we have seen and attempts at going after judges and, and prosecutors and undermining the rule of law at the level uh, that the Kirchners are, are, are you know, uh, uh, undermining it uh, today. Nate, I know you have some questions as well. I do. And, and firstly, Marshall, thanks for inviting me to participate again. And, and thank you to you both for joining us at, at Hudson today. Uh, my first question is sort of a two part uh, uh, question. Um, and it relates to uh, one of the, the many accusations um, Kirchner faces in court at the moment, which is uh, that she uh, somehow co cooperated or colluded, uh, worked with Iran uh, to cover up uh, the 1994 uh, AMIA uh, terrorist attack in, in Buenos Aires, uh, the worst terrorist attack on Argentinian soil ever, uh, and an absolutely extraordinary thing for a, such a senior public official to be accused of. Um, I wonder if you could comment on the current, um, well, just explain very briefly the nature of those allegations. Uh, but secondly, what, given the attacks on the justice system at the moment, do you think are the prospects uh, for that case proceeding? Uh, and then the second uh, and related part of that question is, have you seen, um, in your view, uh, the Fernandez Kirchner um, administration seeking to re-engage. We've talked about some of the neighboring uh, sort of kleptocratic authoritarian regimes, Venezuela, Cuba, but have you also seen them trying to re-engage uh, some of the more powerful authoritarian regimes uh, such as Iran? Uh, uh, China, for example, has an extraordinary uh, amount of uh, financial and political uh, investment in Argentina. Uh, Ru Russia, Kirchner enjoyed strong uh, relations with uh, in her first term. Um, so I wonder if you could uh, comment on those two things. Uh, Maria, Eugenia, perhaps, uh, maybe you could go first at least. Thanks. Bueno, muchas gracias, Nate. Tengo como tres preguntas, este, o, 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 tres, tres temas diferentes. Uno es el pacto con Irán, el memorándum de entendimiento con Irán, firmado por Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, y que en su momento generó Este, por supuesto, muchos embates sobre la inconstitucionalidad, porque en definitiva se eh, pensó que estaban encubriéndose a los principales imputados de los atentados terroristas en la Argentina. Eh, ese memorándum avanzó durante el gobierno de Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, cuando deja el poder y los jueces pueden con libertad este, pronunciarse, fue declarado inconstitucional y se inicia un expediente por el encubrimiento a los iraníes, que termina con un fiscal federal muerto en la Argentina, que es el doctor Alberto Nisman, eh, quien era que eh, el, 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 al, a la semana siguiente de su muerte iba a ir a exponer al Senado de la Nación los argumentos que, sobre la imputación de encubrimiento. Hoy esa causa que sigue vigente está siendo también atacada desde los estamentos del Estado con una Cristina Fernández de Kirchner que hoy es vicepresidenta y pide la nulidad del caso, y un procurador del Tesoro de la Nación, que también está imputado y también sale desde la oficina de la Procuración del Tesoro de la Nación a pedir la nulidad del caso a los jueces, eh, y con un senador de la Nación que está atacando hoy al procurador general del que hablábamos desde el Senado, también imputado, y con un viceministro de Justicia imputado en la causa del pacto con Irán. Frente a la debilidad institucional que estamos describiendo y los ataques, es muy difícil pensar que ese caso llegue a buen puerto, mientras obviamente este gobierno este, siga siendo eh, a cargo del poder ejecutivo y ejerciendo el poder del modo en que está ejerciendo el poder. Eso con relación al pacto con, con Irán y haber pactado con los iraníes, que, eh, que trae a la Argentina nuevamente a este gobierno amigo de Venezuela, eh, hablaba Marshall antes de la habilitación de los negocios con Venezuela, 
todas las alertas al sistema financiero argentino que había emitido la Unidad de Información Financiera fueron dadas de baja por la actual Unidad de Información Financiera Argentina, por lo cual hoy hay vía libre para operar con Venezuela, más allá de lo que cada uno de los actores del sistema argentino quiera hacer por las amenazas que pueda implicar eh, operar con el régimen de Venezuela. Eh, como ustedes saben, por mandato del GAFI, los listados obligatorios son los del Consejo, Nacional, los con, del Consejo de Seguridad de Naciones Unidas o los listados propios que se generaron en la Argentina, pero las nominaciones de OFAC este, son hoy por hoy, más allá de la recomendación de que sean ten, tenidas en cuenta y todas las nominaciones que se han hecho los listados de la oficina de, de OFAC, este, son voluntaria por parte de los sujetos obligados y de los actores de nuestro sistema, con lo cual las alertas de hecho hoy están dadas de baja, con lo cual la operatoria con Venezuela se estima que se va a acrecentar y con eso, como decía Mariano, los riesgos globales de operar con la Argentina porque estaríamos operando con Venezuela. Y más allá de esto, de los países amigos, sabemos que Irán este, tiene a Venezuela y a Cuba como un régimen, como, como países amigos. Hoy, para, para resumir quizás la pregunta y no extenderme, tengo que decir que la Argentina recibe vacunas nada más que de Rusia y China. Eh, hemos, hemos malogrado cualquier otro contrato para poder adquirir gente, vacunas para los argentinos de otros laboratorios importantes y hoy la ayuda viene de China y Rusia y ustedes saben que si... Eh, las alianzas eh, geopolíticas, las, las, las alianzas internacionales son estratégicas para ayudar a los países y los Estados Unidos difícilmente pueda ayudar a un país que le está dando la espalda a las principales amenazas regionales con las que deberíamos aliarnos y estamos mirando para el lado de países que financian terrorismo. Entonces realmente si Argentina necesita ayuda difícilmente la obtenga de, de países que quieren hacer bien las cosas en materia de integridad, de lucha de financiamiento con el terrorismo, y miramos a países aliados de la región que son amigos de los regímenes de Irán, de Rusia y de China. ¿no? Yeah, I, I would I would just add, uh, I think it was a very uh, complete uh, uh, explanation, but I would just add that the gateway to uh, to Iran, uh, to uh, a stronger partnership with extreme uh, with extremist regimes is Venezuela, and and um, it, it's clear that the Argentine government has has uh, set its course towards Venezuela, has established and strengthened the partnership. Not only did they withdraw from the Lima Group, they voted in favor of Venezuela at every single instance that they had the opportunity to in different international fora and organizations at the UN, at the OAS, every time uh, an issue, uh, a, a sanction, a condemnation of Venezuela shows up, uh, Argentina is there to provide their vote in support. And uh, and, and it's clear to, to all of us that uh, yeah, the penetration of Iran in Venezuela and even of its proxies like Hezbollah in Venezuela uh, is, is not only now a hypothesis, it's real, it's concrete, It's putting at, at, at risk not only Venezuela and uh, security and integrity, but also the integrity of uh, its neighboring countries. We're seeing very unusual things taking place in Colombia uh, these days with Venezuelan operatives also uh, introduced into their, their jurisdiction. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 Col and I've had, had the opportunity to speak also with former colleagues and, and Uh, investigators in Colombia who are very concerned also with the risks uh, uh, of uh, extreme Iran-backed terrorism in, uh, in Colombia, which is one of the reasons why Colombia, um, after our designation uh, in 2019, also proceeded to designate Hezbollah as, as a terrorist organization uh, as well. The, the, the threats are real, uh, the, um, uh, the partnerships Are, are real and 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 this puts i think uh, at risk uh, the stability of the entire hemisphere including the, the the national security of the of the us as well i suspect marshall me, probably me gustaría agregar me perdón me, me gustaría agregar el último el último comunicado de la cancillería argentina el ministerio de relaciones exteriores frente a los bombardeos que se están sucediendo por el grupo Hamas desde la franja de Gaza hacia Israel, 
un comunicado de la Embajada de la Cancillería Argentina señalando que en realidad están sorprendidos por el nivel de respuesta de Israel en lugar de condenar el ataque terrorista de Hamas hacia la población civil de Israel. ¿no? Esto te marca, me parece, un poco qué es lo que está pasando hoy en la Argentina con este tipo de, de temas y con este tipo de amenazas. Uh, absolutely, I'm, I'm sure we'll return to that in, in just a moment. Thank you both. I wanted to just, um, uh, in addition to those kinds of abuses of, of power uh, and, and concerns, I wanted to talk particularly about cor corruption, though. Um, and one of the big uh, money laundering cases, or the biggest money laundering case that was uh, resolved earlier this year was that of uh, the family of Lazaro Baez, who, who, laund who laundered uh, 60 million, uh, was it 60 million dollars um, from public contracts, a case that uh, Mario and I think, uh, I think you both worked on uh, or were, were aware of and involved in. Um, so I wondered if you could uh, explain what that case was about. It's very complicated, so maybe in very uh, sort of uh, succinct terms. But also, um, you mentioned, Mariano, um, that a lot of the, the stolen wealth um, uh, in Argentina finds its way offshore, uh, and some of it even ends up in the United States. Uh, do you have a sense um, of the scale of that, of how much money uh, has been spirited out of the country in that way? And is there anything you'd like to see the US do um, in addition to things like the Global Magnitsky sanctions um, in order to try and clamp down on, that, on the, this kind of corruption? Yes, well, uh, let me start with Bias then. Uh, I, I think, you know, Bias is definitely the largest uh, money laundering case that has been tried in Argentina. Uh, a conviction was reached uh, uh, last month, uh, 12 years imprisonment for, for Bias and uh, several hundred million dollars uh, uh, confiscated and uh, in fines also uh, applied to him. Um, Baez was was basically a close friend of the Kirchners. Um, when to, just to illustrate the friendship, when Nestor Kirchner died, he built him a huge mausoleum to bury his uh, remains and offered it to Christine as a gift. But their friendship dated back to to the 90s when uh, Baez was a mere cashier at a local bank in the, a remote province of Argentina, the province of Santa Cruz in the deep south Patagonia region. And uh, Nestor Kirchner was the governor of such province. Uh, province. That's how they built uh, the relationship. Nestor Kirchner then appointed him secretary general of the province uh, and, and, and Baez started making it up the ranks. But when Kirchner was appointed uh, 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 president, uh, Baez incorporated just a few days before the inauguration of President Kirchner, he incorporated a company called Austral Construcciones, a flagship company. Uh, and to favor Baez, the federal government under Kirchner as president transferred large amounts of funds to the province of Santa Cruz for the allocation of public works contracts. Look, 11% of the federal budget for public works um, was transferred to a single province, the province of Santa Cruz. And Santa Cruz is not really the most productive, let's say, province of Argentina. However, it received the same amount of funding for public works as the province of Buenos Aires, which is the richest and most productive and most populous uh, one in the country. So Baez received more than 75% of the contracts for public works in that province. Out of that 11% of the national budget, he got 75% of all the contracts. Of course, most of his works uh, had surcharges, in some cases up to 50%. We were, we were able to find surcharges of up to 100, 150% of the real cost. And some of the works were never completed. But, uh, you know, he was very privileged. He always had the benefit of uh, being paid on time. The government back then had an average delay of 160, 165 days to pay contractors. Bias always got paid on time. Uh, and of course, this generated massive wealth for Bias. Between 2003 and 2015, uh, the years the Kirchners were in power, Bias increased his net worth by 12,000%. 12,000%. And his company, Austral Construcciones, was even uh, you know, more fortunate, more lucky than that. 45,000% increase in the net worth of the company during those years. Of course, as Bias's worth and net worth increased, so did the Kirchner's. 
the Kirchner's net worth increased during their presidential term by 3,500%. Unexplainable, taking into account we had one of the world's largest financial prices in, in the middle of those uh, terms. When you look at the net worth of the Kirchner's, when you look at how that um, uh, net worth grew during those years, most of it, at least most of the declared net worth is explained by buys. Because buys not only got those contracts, not only got 75% of the contracts in with that single province, but then went back, came back after laundering his money and across the global financial system and rented out the hotels that were owned by the Kirchners, rented them out for years without a single guest having been ever recorded in those hotels as a way of paying back, uh, you know, kicking back the money into who the real owners were, which we believe were the Kirchners. In fact, Eugenia and I um, made a presentation right before uh, leaving our, our office where we argued that, that Baez is really the Kirchners. Baez is the middleman of the Kirchners. And, and uh, we offered 75 points of evidence to demonstrate that in, uh, to the courts. That part of the case is still uh, waiting to be resolved. And you asked more, but I forgot. <laughs> yeah, so I was just interested. You said a lot of the wealth uh, washed its way around in the global financial system. Yes. Some of it ended up in the United States. Uh, right. You mentioned in your introductory remarks, uh, global Magnitsky sanctions uh, for, for corruption. Are there, are there other things you would like to see the United States uh, and other democracies doing to try and clamp down on dirty, dirty money flows in this way? Well, uh, we, we actually, uh, thanks to the cooperation we received uh, from the United States, and I take this opportunity to thank Marshall in his capacity as Assistant Secretary uh, of the Treasury, uh, we, um, and also your predecessor, uh, who's now my boss, <laughs> Danny Glaser, uh, together, working together, uh, we instituted the uh, Argentina-US Dialogue on Illicit Finances which was, I think, a fundamental pillar to enhance the cooperation in the fight against corruption, not only against corruption, also against terrorism, also against drug trafficking as well. Uh, and we were able, thanks to that cooperation, to, uh, to identify many flows that had come actually from Argentina to uh, the United States. Look, in the Bias case, for instance, uh, Bias used to launder his money 123 companies uh, that were incorporated in Nevada um, through the Mossack Fonseca um, office subsidiary uh, in Nevada that fortunately has now been closed. Um, but uh, you see, there are a lot, I think, of uh, vulnerabilities that can be uh, 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 addressed to, uh, to mitigate these type of risks. In the notebooks case, in the cuadernos case, we were also able to identify, thanks to the cooperation we received from the US, um, you know, uh, Daniel Munoz, he was the, the secretary, uh, private secretary of Christina Kirchner. He bought properties in South Florida for uh, over $70 million, real estate, real estate properties. He bought two apartments in New York at the Plaza uh, Hotel overlooking the Central Park on Central Park South. Beautiful apartments, beautiful. But uh, he really didn't have the money to demonstrate the, or the, 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 the licit money to demonstrate that he had the capacity to buy uh, those apartments and nevertheless was able to do so. So I think, you know, of course, this is the world's largest financial system. Uh, it's a, an attractive economy. It's a stable economy. Uh, everyone wants to, um, you know, invest in this country. And, uh, uh, and of course, this in and of itself creates an inherent vulnerability. Um, but uh, there is a lot we can do, I think, still to, uh, to mitigate corruption and, 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 and singling out corrupt officials, uh, designating them as such. Uh, when we have the evidence, when we have uh, the, uh, the cases like the ones I just described that demonstrate with facts that they not only post a risk to the integrity of a remote financial system, but also to the integrity of the U.S. financial system. I think would be an appropriate way of dealing with that. Thanks, so I cheated with two two-part questions, so I'll hand back to Marshall now. Thank, thanks for that. Um, so, Mariano and, and Maria Hena, I wanna pick up on exactly what you were just talking about. Um, and I have two questions for you that I'm gonna to bundle together because they're related um, uh, from Nicholas Nahamas of the Miami Herald. Uh, and 
particularly Nicholas is asking, do, do you expect there to be interference in the criminal case involving the widow of Daniel uh, Munoz, that's Carlina Pochetti? Uh, has it already happened? If it does happen, how, how will it occur? What, what should we look for? And secondly, you, know, you mentioned the real estate issues. It was one of my frustrations that we were not able to achieve in, in the Trump administration a requirement much as you have to do if you sell property in the United States, you disclose to the IRS um, who, what, you've, what you've sold your property for. We'd like to see a similar requirement uh, for the purchaser to file, the ultimate beneficial owner and the origin of funds for real estate. We weren't yet able to get that done. I'm hoping the Biden administration completes our, our work. But what more from an Argentinian perspective do you believe the United States should do to crack down on the US status as a safe haven for laundered funds, particularly in the real estate business? Um, well, I think, you know, first of all, designating real estate agents as uh, reporting entities could be a good uh, step forward. It's required by the international standard and uh, many countries uh, have done that. Um, I was actually, I have to say, quite surprised uh, spending time now uh, in Miami uh, myself and, and seeing um, you know, how lax the attitude towards the risks of money laundering uh, is on, in the, on the private sector side, I have to say. And, uh, and I think there's a lot that can be done there as well, because um, you know, the risks are high. It's an attractive jurisdiction. Um, as I say, there are many places in this country that attract uh, honest people, of course, the vast majority are honest people that want to invest and protect their wealth here, but that also attract uh, criminals. And, 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 and that uh, money that flows in is, is, is not only causing problems to other countries, it's also causing problems to, to the integrity of, of, the, uh, of the American financial system. So um, let me just leave it at that. That's one measure that I think could be done, um, Marshall. I, Eugenia, I don't know if you have any other ideas. I wasn't sí, prepared to advise habla... the U.S. government. <laughs> eh, no, quizás por la respuesta del periodista, la, la respuesta del periodista que hablaba de Pochetti, que en verdad es el caso Muñoz y qué más se podría hacer. Lo que hay que decir es que eh, todos estos casos involucran a personas que hoy volvieron al gobierno argentino y que obviamente entonces están otra vez y nuevamente este, a cargo de lugares desde donde estos hechos de corrupción que en su momento y que ahora están siendo investigados pueden volver a cometerse. Son los mismos actores con casos eh, de obra pública y de corrupción y de falta de integridad que involucraron tantos millones de dinero y tantos millones de dólares este, que circulan sin duda por el sistema americano y por todo el mundo. Para que tengan una idea, este, los montos de la, de la causa original de la ruta del dinero K, de la caso Baez, el caso Baez es, es un eslabón del medio, el primer eslabón por un billón de dólares de obra pública era la obra que se le asignó a Baez, ese caso de vialidad todavía no tiene sentencia, el caso Baez que es el, millón, el billón de dólares que anduvo por todo el sistema financiero internacional, es el que tiene sentencia. Y luego tenemos los otros dos casos, de los Sauces y Otesur, que se involucran directamente a Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, que quizás es más operatoria local porque el dinero reingresó a la Argentina. Estamos hablando de un billón de dólares en uno de los casos, otro billón de dólares en la ruta del dinero acá, alrededor de eh, 13 millones de dólares involucrados en la causa de los Sauces, 80 millones de dólares en la causa de Otesur. En la causa de los cuadernos hablamos de 20 billones de dólares que circulan por el sistema internacional y todas las personas que están involucradas en esos casos siguen operando en el sistema internacional y quizás contaminándolo a partir de estos casos de corrupción que marcan origen de dinero ilícito. Entonces, ¿qué más pueden hacer? Este, bueno, los que están a cargo de sus sistemas financieros y cuidando la integridad ver un poquito quiénes están involucrados en estos asuntos de gravísima repercusión institucional con prueba absolutamente agregada a los expedientes por cooperación que hemos recibido del mundo y que difícilmente en la Argentina, en el estado en el que nos encontramos, 
tengan sentencias condenatorias. Si el mundo para activar sentencias, para activar, si el mundo para activar sanciones va a esperar condenas de la Argentina, bueno, olvídense, estamos avisando que en la Argentina estos casos difícilmente puedan arribar a instancias de sentencia. Eso solo quería agregar. You know, the, the, uh, coming back to, you got me thinking, uh, of course, you said, Marshall, the, uh, there are many, many uh, solutions that have been addressed by the new AML Act that will come into force. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the issue of beneficial ownership is, is key, is fundamental. And I think this will bring uh, a, a clear, uh, you know, uh, a, a, it will bring a tool to facilitate, um, you know, the mitigation of, of, of risks in the system. But, uh, but again, precisely because of what uh, Eugenia was just describing, I think, I think the power of the designations is, 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 uh, is uh, fundamental to really single out who is who in this, uh, in this game is key to help financial institutions also understand and be able to mitigate their risks uh, in, in an effective way. It's not just a, a, a designation uh, for government purposes or for the protection of national security purposes. It's also, I think, a way to provide a tool for financial institutions to manage the risks more more effectively effectively and protect the integrity of the of the financial system accordingly yeah i think you're right um the you know ian tally uh, with the wall street journal uh, makes a pretty good point here uh, that uh, uh sanctioning a, a a leader even a vice president is an unusually aggressive action for the, for the united states we have done it uh, we did it in the case of zimbabwe Uh, we did it in the case of Maduro in Venezuela, but short of that, um, be interested in whether you believe there are other uh, clearly identifiable uh, members of the Kirchner kleptocracy uh, that would would it would be appropriate to single them out with a GLOMAC uh, type of designation. Uh, and then, as we are getting to time after you comment on that. Uh, I want to return to the EMEA bombing uh, because I've got a number of questions from both Ian uh, and from Nathan uh, on Hezbollah in particular. And of course, we're watching the negotiations in Vienna very closely because many of us believe that the end result uh, of the Biden administration's desperate desire to return to the JCPOA will be a complete release of hard currency to the Iranian regime and an immediate pass through to the terror apparatus that the IRGC and the Quds Force maintain. Uh, with huge implications for the Western Hemisphere and Argentina in particular. But before I go there, uh, comment if you would on other key interlocutors that are part of the Kirchner orbit that, where the Global Magnitsky Act would be pertinent. Los casos, eh, sí, el ministro de Obras Públicas eh, debido ministro de Obras Públicas durante todo el periodo de gobierno de ambos presidentes Kirchner, eh, tiene muchísimas, infinitas imputaciones en cada uno de los esquemas de corrupción de obra pública, de energía, eh, realmente los involucramientos son muy severos, digo por esquemas de corrupción sistémicos y estructurales que se hayan instalado durante todos estos años, este, y como lo señalaban los jueces, como una organización criminal, casi por así decirlo, una asociación ilícita a cargo de los estamentos del Estado. Eh, es difícil dar así rápidamente quizás nombres de, 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 denominados en los casos eh, que surja tan patentemente, obviamente quien estaba a cargo del, del Ejecutivo era Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, eh, el, el involucramiento de sus hijos, eh, quizás Máximo Kirchner con mayor claridad por su edad y por, su, por su, sí, sus distintos roles, y me animo a decir así rápidamente, eh, por supuesto al ministro de Obras Públicas eh, eh, debido. El resto de los casos de corrupción forman parte del, de la misma familia del kirchnerismo, porque quizás el, el rol del vicepresidente Amado Boudou, ex ministro de Economía, ex vicepresidente de la Nación, recibe una condena de corrupción por, 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 por querer quedarse con la casa de la moneda, por así decirlo, 
Eh, y bueno, no, no sé si se puede determinar esto como un hecho aislado o no, o como parte de todo un estamento y organización del Estado este, con distintos roles que se cumplieron para poder cometer todos estos distintos hechos de, de corrupción. Perdón. Vicepresi ex vicepresidente de la Nación, condenado por corrupción firme por la Corte Suprema que hoy recibe por dictamen del Procurador del Tesoro de la Nación, como les conté, quien está involucrado en el pacto con Irán, quien era secretario legal y técnico de la Presidencia en, el en la época de Cristina, dictamina a favor de otorgarle una pensión graciable y honorífica a Vudú, condenado por corrupción, este, percibiendo altísimas sumas mensuales de dinero eh, porque bueno, supuestamente su rol ha sido de, de cumplimiento honorífico y, y sin embargo tiene esta condena por corrupción. Entonces quizás uno tiene que verlo como una verdadera organización, ir haciendo una vinculación entre todos los casos de corrupción para decidir este, quiénes, has, quiénes han sido determinados miembros de la cleptocracia que sufrió nuestra Argentina. We're almost uh, out of time. I have one final uh, question and then I'd invite um, Maria Aguina and uh, Mariano to, uh, for any concluding thoughts that you would like the Hudson viewership to consider. Um, but let's, let's return to the EMEA bombing. Uh, you know, Mariano, you and I were there at the 25th uh, anniversary commemorating the, this tragic, this horrific event, 85 Argentinians killed, hundreds wounded, um, And so far, the perpetrators, uh, you know, continue to operate abroad with impunity. Um, what what were you able to accomplish during your tenure regarding Hezbollah, particularly with regard to the tri-border area? Uh, and <clears throat> how do you feel uh, that that fight is going, or have they, in essence, discontinued? Uh, all of the good progress that the two of you made, both in designating Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, taking the lead in Latin America, in fact, uh, it's because of your leadership and that of President Macri, that we were able to get other countries in the region to follow uh, with similar designations. And I do recall the very successful disruption uh, that you had of the Barakat clan uh, using the casino to launder money. Talk a little bit about that and about whether Uh, that kind of uh, work is, you think, is continuing, or uh, are they now turning a blind eye to these kinds of activities? Okay, um, let me first say that that uh, you know our, our interest in in uh, countering the financing of terrorism came from the outset of our uh, uh, term in from the beginning of our term in office, but uh, it was through the strategic partnership that we had with the United States, the U.S. Argentina U.S. dialogue and illicit finances that we were able to motorize uh, and to uh, actually work together in understanding the magnitude of the threat and in taking the right type of actions uh, to, to mitigate them uh, together. Because these are threats that not only affect Argentina, uh, if they affect the region as a whole, and of course they also affect the United States. So while we were investigating uh, the threats in the tri-border area, we came across the Barakat clan, uh, was uh, laundering money, the proceeds of illicit activity. And I think this is a, a great case that shows the convergence between uh, you know, organized crime and terrorism and terrorist financing as well, because these guys were you know, involved in money laundering, smuggling, fraudulent activities, uh, for a piracy of products, trafficking in arms. They were laundering those proceeds uh, through our casinos in uh, the tri-border area and then going back to uh, uh, other countries in, in, in that region, to Paraguay, to Brazil, uh, presumably to wire that money over to Lebanon. One of the members of the clan, Ahmad Assad Barakat, uh, was the uh, known treasurer of Hezbollah in the tri-border area for many years. Um, we started pursuing, we, we started working uh, uh, to tackle this organization and, and, and you know, uh, the idea of uh, designating Hezbollah as a terrorist organization Uh, uh, was, was, was brought up. Uh, we discussed it with President Macri. Of course, the evidence was there. The intelligence was there. Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. We were able to demonstrate that through uh, the vast amount of evidence that's out there, including the evidence where uh, Hezbollah itself uh, attributes to itself 
the commission of terrorist acts. But it's not only a global terrorist organization, it's a terrorist organization that has attacked Argentina, that attacked Argentina twice. And the evidence in the cases demonstrated uh, that uh, Hezbollah had been responsible for masterminding, planning, uh, and executing the attacks, of course, with the support of Iran. Uh, but not only was it a terrorist organization, a global one, that had conducted terrorist attacks against Argentina, it was also an organization that represented a current risk, a, 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 a present risk to our uh, financial integrity and to our national security. And the Barak had case demonstrated that. So we felt that it was, uh, uh, you know, we needed to resort to measures to uh, address this threat in, a, in an effective way and creating a designations mechanism because unfortunately the UN has not come together uh, with, with Hezbollah for political reasons that we, that we know and the protection they get from um, some of the Security Council uh, members. But we needed to find the, me the mechanism then to be able to protect ourselves. And that's how we came up with the idea of establishing our own sanctions regime, our own public registry to designate terrorists and tech terrorist financiers. And we proceeded to incorporate into that registry, not only all of the ones designated by the UN, but also Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, and also as well, the Iranians that were implied in the uh, AMIA attacks, which we also included uh, as, as, as terrorists in our, in our registry. And that triggered, I think, a momentum in the region that we had never seen before with the designation of Paraguay, uh, that Paraguay's president made of uh, Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, Colombia, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, which I hope will be will be followed through. Unfortunately, in Argentina, what we would have expected was for additional designations to continue to take place in connection with additional networks that continue to pose a risk to uh, our financial integrity and, and our security. We actually had to fight to contain, to ensure that the present designations were not removed. Fortunately, they have not been. Uh, but there was certainly no advancement uh, going forward. I don't know, Eugenia, if you have any thoughts on that as well. No, con respecto a este tema, este, está todo dicho. Está todo dicho. Está todo dicho. Well, hey, my friends, I, I could go on all day with you, uh, and it's great to see you, uh, Maria Eugenia. Um, we're a little bit over time, but I would invite you to offer any final uh, comments um, that you want our audience, you want to reach to our audience. Um, we're here to give you a platform. You are fighting the good fight against corruption and you're doing it from Argentina, um, which is a testament to your, um, your, your willpower and your strength and your willingness to, to stand up despite efforts to, uh, uh, to silence you. Uh, and Mariano, uh, from you as well. But first, uh, Maria Eugenia. Bueno, desde Argentina, este, muchas gracias, muchas gracias por este, este espacio y este apoyo. Este, son tiempos difíciles aquí. Creo que, que la lucha no es solo un tema de, de, de corrupción, que realmente estamos eh, viendo cómo sucede en la región una lucha entre las democracias y el socialismo del siglo XXI que arrasa con las instituciones, con la integridad, que no quiere los controles internacionales tampoco, no les asustan quedarse fuera del mundo por ser deudores o porque el GAFI les haga una mala evaluación, no quieren los controles internacionales y que llevar a la gente de la Argentina en las próximas elecciones que, que vean empíricamente lo que sucede en los países con los que nos estamos alineando que son países donde la libertad de expresión no existe, donde el poder, la división de poderes no existe, el poder es absoluto, la búsqueda es la de perpetuarse en el poder, eh, no hay libertad de prensa, no hay libertades individuales, tenemos hoy en el tratamiento en el Congreso una ley para asumir superpoderes por parte del Poder Ejecutivo Nacional, y esto habla a las claras de hacia dónde está yendo la Argentina, no solo en materia de lucha contra la corrupción, sino como gobierno autoritario, totalitario, de hambre, de miseria, que necesitan ese hambre y ese, esa miseria para perpetuarse en el poder una vez que hayan tomado el poder judicial, combatido la libertad de prensa y tomados estamentos electorales importantes para poder 
así hacerlo como lo vemos en otros países de la región. Así que no tengo nada bueno para transmitir en el sentido de hacia dónde es el rumbo, sí de que quienes permanecemos acá y con la ayuda de todos ustedes vamos a seguir peleando para una Argentina distinta con un potencial muy grande eh, y ojalá no se desanimen muchos, no se resignen y podamos este, obviamente poder pegar el golpe de timón que se necesita. Muchas gracias. So, uh, thank you very much for, for this opportunity to, to speak to you today. I would just like to conclude very briefly by saying this is not only uh, a fight against crime, against corruption, against uh, uh, terrorism uh, and terrorist financing. It's, it's a fight for our values. Um, I think what's being challenged here is uh, the, are the fundamental values that sustain our democracies, our republic, uh, the rule of law, uh, the, uh, uh, the values of integrity uh, and transparency that, that, that we believe in and the value that is of our democracy, our democratic values. Uh, and uh, this is what's under threat today in, in Latin America and in Argentina in particular. And as I said uh, uh, over and over throughout this discussion, the, the risks to those values that are affecting those countries in the globalized world that we live in uh, are also risks to the rest of the world, uh, and particularly uh, to uh, a country like the United States, where everything, anything that happens in this hemisphere poses a risk to, uh, its, uh, to its national security and to, uh, and to its people. So um, I think anyone who cares about these values should care about what's happening today in Argentina. Well said, and I think on that note, uh, I wanna thank Nate, uh, my colleague with the Kleptocracy Initiative from the Hudson Institute, and particularly uh, Mariano Yu and Maria Ajena. Thank you for spending time with us, and uh, we look forward to continuing the discussion and continuing to invite the Biden administration to pay attention to the Western Hemisphere and to focus on what is happening in Argentina. Thanks again, my friends, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you very much.